I'm Jamie Owen, and this is The Secret Betrayal. In this podcast series, we tell the story of how a brutal policy of forced repatriation caused thousands of Chinese seamen to disappear from Liverpool at the end of the Second World War, a policy that the Labour government carried out in secrecy that would leave families and the Chinese community broken. When people know about it, they care about it. They are horrified. And many people just don't understand or couldn't believe that this has happened. And I think that actually getting their story out there, their experience, however painful it is to listen to, is incredibly important so that we do not repeat the same mistakes again. We want the, someone to say sorry and put forward the truth that that really what happened. A government decision hasn't got any right to separate me or my family from our history or our culture. We actually have to explain to our children who we are, where we're from, what our race is. And it's wrong that I can't answer them questions because the government's not releasing files. During the Second World War, one in seven merchant seamen in the UK was Chinese. When the war was over, many returned to the lives they'd built in Liverpool. But instead of the hero's welcome received by British servicemen, they found themselves forcibly repatriated, often without warning. Thousands of families were left abandoned, not knowing what had happened to their partners, husbands or fathers. In this, the final episode of The Secret Betrayal, we follow the families and their campaign for recognition, information and truth from the British government. And with so much loss, we find out how Liverpool's Chinese community is attempting to reconcile its past and remember their lost members. On July the 21st, 2021, in the 75th anniversary year of the forced repatriation, Kim Johnson, a Liverpool Labour MP, addressed the issue in the House of Commons. Oral testimonies from Liverpoolians who witnessed the events provide accounts of immigration wagons prowling the streets of Liverpool and seizing men by force, police forcing their way into boarding houses, home visits from undercover officers to seize documents and erase any record of the deported seamen. And we know around 2,000 seamen were deported, snatched from their homes and their loved ones and dumped unceremoniously on the shores of a homeland many had left decades before. And their families were never told what was happening, never given a chance to object or even the chance to say goodbye. And most of the Chinese seamen's bishop wives and partners went to their graves never knowing the truth, left to believe that their husbands had abandoned them along with their children, suffering immeasurable trauma from the actions of the British government. And it was only decades later when declassified official records revealed the shocking truth did the children begin to understand what had happened after the war and begin to make sense of the wrongs that had been done to them, causing untold grief for the remaining family members. But for all of the painful revelations that have been uncovered, much is still unknown. Kevin Foster, minister in the ruling Conservative Party in the Home Office, conceded that lessons must be learned from the experience of the men and their British Chinese families. I think it is important we learn from the past. We would all sit here now and say this is not a policy that would be implemented today. And it's something that is absolutely shocking that those who had literally risked their lives throughout the Battle of the Atlantic then found themselves treated in that manner. But I think it's right that we then capture that and make sure that those taking decisions in the future are aware of where we've come from as a nation as we move forward in our mission. And on behalf of the government, can I express our deep regret that some of those would face the most extreme dangers of war to keep our country supplied in its darkest hours were treated in this way. Kevin Foster did not apologise but as a result of that debate, asked Home Office officials to investigate the story further. Their report, published in August 2022, described how seamen were deported, 
and prevented from telling their families. It concluded that language used to justify the deportations at the time was racially inflected and prejudicial. Kim Johnson called the events a stain on our history and went on to say, the report finally debunks the myth parroted by successive British governments that these repatriations were all voluntary. The conspiracy between the state and the shipping companies to maintain a cheap pool of labor along racial lines is in many ways the story of empire and the story of Liverpool. I recently met Kim along with the deported sailors, surviving family members and other campaigners at the Pagoda Art Centre in Liverpool. You know, when you hear the emotion out of the family members around the table today, they were left bereft. Fathers and grandfathers were taken off the street. They felt they were abandoned. And for so many years, they didn't know what had happened to them. They didn't know that the, the government and the police were complicit in their removal. You know, they only became aware of that when the papers were released. Labour MP Sarah Owen is chair of East and Southeast Asians for the Labour Party, and she's been helping campaign for justice for the families. Emotions are still very raw, even though this is a historic injustice that people refer to, that the Home Office refers to. Though the, the injustice is historic, the pain, the emotions are still very present. Judy Kinnan was raised by her grandmother. With no official word on what had become of her father, her mother clung to rumours and conspiracy theories. Judy was an adult before she was able to find the truth. For the sake of her children and her grandchildren, Judy wants the British government to tell her what really happened to her father, Chang Lang. In her late 70s, she knows time is running out for her. What's your message to the government, the Labour Party? What, what, what do you want them to do? Tell the truth. I want to know, you know, did he survive or did they blow him up? And what do you say to those people who will say, this was all a long time ago, isn't it just time to move on? W what would they do if it was their father? You'd want to know. I don't care who you are. I feel as if, no matter what, you'd want to know, if you could. You know, and they've been hiding it all these years. You know what I mean? I mean, say, the way my husband passed away so quickly, that could happen to me and I'll never know. And I think that's what we're waiting for. Are they just waiting for you all to die I off? think so, yeah. Then they've got no one to commit to then, have they? It's hurtful, though. It hurts. Because you're all getting older. I mean, yeah, I've met yeah. lots of you and everyone is getting on. I know we are. Well, we've got to be, haven't we? You know what I mean? I think it's awful. I mean, so even all my children, my grandchildren, think it's disgusting why we've never found out and why they can't just tell us. Why do you think they won't tell us? Anne Pearson is also seeking truth. Her grandfather, Chow Ah Wong, was one of those who disappeared. Her grandmother was left unable to cope alone, and Anne's mother was raised by her maternal grandparents. Her mother grew up subjected to racism and never felt like she belonged. For Anne, knowing what happened and whether they have relatives in China is crucial for her family to heal. I feel like we've been robbed, <laughs> slightly, of our heritage. And it's all to do with self-identity, so it matters. And when you don't look the same as other people, you don't quite fit in. There's a negative element there with the racism, and we've never had anything positive to readdress it and rebalance it. And so that's what I want for my mum. She's 76 and she's not getting any younger, and I wanted to have that photograph of her dad. How do you want this story to end? What do you want? I want to find what happened to my granddad. I'm not expecting for him to be alive because it's been so long, but I want to find out something about him, where he came from, what happened to him when he did go back, and if he did get married again and have family, because that means then that we've got family, and my mum's got half-brothers and sisters in China, which, you know, that's a link to our Chinese heritage and they will be our family. And to have a photograph of my, of my granddad for my mum, that'll be my biggest achievement in life, if I can achieve that for my mum. 
One of the avenues that Anne is pursuing is through recent DNA techniques. Are you sure she wants to know? Yes. She can't speak up herself, but she's given me her blessing. She's agreed and she has given me her DNA, which I have put on Ancestry. Um, and she's agreed for me to have another sample of DNA so we can put it on WeGene and put it on the Chinese website. And that's my mum's DNA. How will she deal with those stories if they come, when they come? We'll hold her up, her family will hold her up and support her. And the Chinese community that are half and half like her, we'll, we'll all be together and we'll all support each other because we're not on our own. We're not on our own. There's thousands of them out there. Like I say, we've only just learnt in the last 10 years. And so there'll be families out there that are Chinese. They'll have grandchildren that are Chinese and they don't know and they won't know that their granddad was a merchant seaman. And maybe this will be the thing that sparks their questions and make them look at themselves and go, oh, well, could this be, could this be me? Because that's how, I, that's how I discovered it. And actually, yeah, that was me as well. Keith Coughlin admitted he used to be a loner and a shy boy. He grew up believing his father Soon Kwai Sing was killed at sea and never questioned what he was told. Keith was himself a merchant seaman. Now retired, he's been investigating his father's disappearance for a number of years. He discovered that despite what he was told, his dad was not killed at sea, but repatriated to China, remarried, and had another son and two daughters. The son, Keith's half-brother, is still alive. I caught up with Keith to hear more. You spent 20 years of your life trying to get to the bottom of the story. What is it that drives you so hard? What is it that motivates you? For the children who were left behind to know about their fathers who disappeared. What do you want to say to the Home Office after all of these years? What, 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 what is it that you want? An apology. We don't ask for anything else. We don't really want anything from them. We want the, <clears throat> someone to say sorry and put forward the truth that, that really what happened. You're all getting old now and the years are passing. Back. passing. Are you ever going to get to the bottom of this, will you ever get your truth? No, I don't think so. The good point is that I know the truth and fortunately enough, I've made many, many people aware of what is the truth. What does this whole story say about Britain? I don't like to use the word racist because at that time, during wartime and before the war, I don't think people knew what racist was. They do now. I mean, if something happens now, it's very difficult to cover it up. I would never blame people from this country for anything that happened to these men because they weren't aware of what, what happened. I don't blame them at all. I blame the government for covering it up when they had no need to because these men had sailed the Atlantic and many, many died. Not only did many, many die, their families never knew what happened to them and never will know. Nearly 80 years on, the British government has acknowledged but still not apologised for what happened. In 1946, the deportations were carried out under Britain's Labour government. Some of today's Labour Party MPs continue to press hard to get answers. Kim Johnson again. A number of people before me tried to get some justice for the families of the forcibly departed. I'm going to make it my duty as the MP for this constituency to do everything I can while I'm still the Labour MP. And if I'm re-elected in the next election, I will continue. We mentioned at the meeting today 
that this injustice took place under a Labour-run government, you know, so to have a level of acknowledgement from our current party, you know, would be um, a step in the right direction. Why can't Labour just apologise and just say sorry? I really don't know why they can't do that, you know, um, as the Labour MP for this constituency. I can say that, but I am not the leader of the Labour Party. That conversation would need to be had with the leader of the Labour Party. What do you think this whole story says about Britain? Well, you know, from my point of view, it's very synonymous with Windrush. People were asked to come to this country after the war to work in the NHS, to walk in public services, to rebuild this country, which they did, you know, they give their life to. And then, after giving their life, they were then, again, forcibly repatriated back to a country that they didn't know, you know, so there were elements of racism involved. MP Sarah Owen feels it's important to make her voice heard on behalf of the Liverpool families. But as the chair of East and Southeast Asians for Labour, she's worried about the wider implications of their stories. I think it is about educating people, understanding about what happened, because when people know about it, they care about it. They are horrified, and many people just don't understand or couldn't believe that this has happened. And I think that actually getting their story out there, their experience, however painful it is to listen to, is incredibly important so that we do not repeat the same mistakes again. There's a lot of raw emotion around this table, and a lot of these folks are getting old. They, there's a lot of pressure on you to deliver, isn't there? Because their years are running out, quite simply. I think it is well-placed pressure. You're absolutely right. We are very, very aware, both myself and Kim and everybody else that's campaigning on this, on this issue, that time is critical. Um, but I think that that pressure should be shared now upon everybody else to find results, whether it's through genealogy, whether it is through records, whether it is through any other kind of information that we can find to connect families that should never have been separated in the first place. Why do you think it happens? Why do I think it happens? Ultimately through racism. And when it comes to East and Southeast Asian racism, the UK has been far behind acknowledging the level of racism that is levelled at Chinese people, East Asians and Southeast Asians. We saw the racism of old that saw these Chinese seamen deported rear its ugly head again over the last two years of the COVID pandemic. And what I want to ensure is that we learn from those past mistakes so that we do not continue to have resurgences of racism against our communities because it hadn't gone away. It wasn't like COVID was something new. It was just like it was racism on steroids against us. Now, I have a little girl, and what I don't want to see is that she is subjected to the same racism in this country that other generations have been as well. Part of that solution has to be the Labour Party saying, we got it wrong, we're sorry. That's definitely what some of the people here want, and they want it as part of the solution, and I completely understand that, and I completely get it. But what they also want is action going forward. They want this to be properly memorialised. They want it to be properly documented. They want it to be covered in the media so that more people understand that this is part of our history. History is not always pleasant. History is not always parts of us that we should be proud of. We need to acknowledge when we got it wrong so that we can get it right in the future. Kellyanne's father, Brian Flower, was just a baby when his father, Zyfi Chow, disappeared. His mother became destitute, and Brian ended up in an orphanage, separated from his three siblings. His granddaughter, Kellyanne, believes the UK government is still withholding vital information from them. I don't understand how they think releasing a report saying, oh, yes, we were racist, is addressing it. We all knew you were racist. What we actually want is some help and support getting over the issues we have left. The seamen's pouches are missing. You know, if we could have a photograph of my grandfather and his name written in Chinese characters, we'd be able to pursue research in China and things like that. But what they've actually done, the way they've done it, prevents us from even accessing who we are. It's wrong that a government decision 
is the source of all this misery. And I think the report doesn't really address anything. It just tells us what we already knew happened. A lot of people will say, look, this was a long time ago, and the landscape in which these events unfolded was the chaos of a world war. They could just apologise, though, couldn't they? You know, to actually make people feel better. They could have just said, we're really sorry what happened. There's nobody alive who made those decisions. But they haven't even got the heart to say that. Because if they do apologise, that's taking on more liability from their point of view. So they'll just keep hiding the missing records and not apologising, I believe, till my dad's generation is actually dead. Then maybe they'll find those missing records when there's no one left to sue them. You're understandably so passionate about this. What is it that drives you so much? A government decision hasn't got any right to separate me or my family from our history or our culture. And aside from the personal traumas that it's led my dad through or everybody else's lives through, we actually have to explain to our children who we are, where we're from, what our race is. And it's wrong that I can't answer them questions because the government's not releasing files. Your dad's obviously in his last years, he's getting old. What do you want for him? He would just like a picture of his dad and the name in Chinese characters. And to be honest, after all that he's been through, finding out that he only hasn't got his dad because of a government decision, it's the least we can try and track down for him, really. What does all of this make you think about who you are? Are you English? Are you British? Are you Chinese? I'm British. I'm part Chinese. I carry the surname of a man I'm not even related to. Yeah, I think having a few answers on our own personal family would go a long way to help heal the trauma. Brothers Joe and John have struggled throughout their lives without a father. They grew up believing their father had simply walked out on them as young boys. The resentment Joe felt towards his father caused him to change his family name. But after learning he was forcibly repatriated, Joe's feelings towards his dad have softened. The government disclosure of their past treatment of the Chinese seamen is allowing their relatives to heal. As the understanding starts coming out, of course I've changed it, because if it was taken from us, and we don't know the full truth of it, because it's very hard to establish where he's gone. I do ancestry, and when I get passed to my father, it becomes a block. No, no, where he is or what he's gone. So no, I'm not angry at him anymore. What I want now is the truth. I need, it needs to be exposed. The injustice needs to be put right. And what do you say to those people who will say, look, you know, this country had come out of a terrible war. Liverpool had been bombed. Uh, the country was on its knees. This was all a very, very long time ago. Isn't it time to move on? It's only just come out. That's the reason. If it would have came out a long time ago, we've heard of the Windrush situation. This has happened before the wind recession. These people came over here to help in the war effort. They took them, made their lives at risk coming over here. And they was just treat prejudices in those days, whether they like it or not, was paramount. I can tell you stories that I'd come home from school and trying to wash my skin with pebbles because I'd, of what I'd had to put up with the day before. So if I was like that, and I'm only a descendant, what was his life like and what was my mother's life? She used to work seven days a week. She used to bring crust of bread home from the cafe she worked in to feed us. So when it comes down to the real facts of this was a long time ago, it might have been a long time ago, so there's been an injustice for a long time and it's about time that people stood up and put it right. What do you want? What is it that you want out of all of this? I want to know who my father is, I want to know who my Chinese family is, my, who they are, where they are, because they're a missing part of me, they're a missing part of my family. And that's one of the reasons I've done Ancestry, because of the simple reason I want to know that I could have brothers and sisters or whatever out there, 
No idea. My father, obviously, now, me being 75, is most probably dead now. You know, it doesn't mean to say that he hasn't had further children. It doesn't mean to say that he hasn't got another family, which is part of us, part of our heritage. And one of the things I teach my children and grandchildren is the fact to be proud of your heritage. We was never taught that. We was ashamed. We was made to feel ashamed because we was part Chinese. We had to fight our way. In my early days of school, it was horrendous. But we were brought up. My mother and my grandmother brought us up the correct way. Because, you know, your foundation is your childhood. And because we started off with a foundation without a father, you, you just, you would never know what it's like not having a father. If you could meet him now, all these years on, what is it that you would say to him? Well, I'd give him a big hug first. And say, I'm sorry that this happened to you. And we couldn't do anything about it. But we can now. We want the truth. Own up to what they did. And let us step. Settle. We're not got that many years left in us. But we just want the truth. The Pagoda Art Centre in Liverpool is a place where the local Chinese community come together. Its staff have been involved in the campaign for justice. They're trying to establish a permanent memorial dedicated to all the Chinese seamen who were so instrumental in the success of Liverpool and to remember those lost through a racist government policy. Zilan Lau is the chief executive of the centre. Peter Fu, who was one of the left behind children that he's like, have been campaigning for an apology from the government. And um, one of his dreams is to get an apology from the government and set up a memorial garden for the seamen that was deported. And that's the next step that they want to do is with the local councillor, want to set up a memorial garden in Chinatown, commemorating the contribution from the Chinese communities. Because the dock and import export still a lot are happening in Liverpool, and that will be a place to commemorating all this uh, contribution from the Chinese community. And we hope in a few years' time it will happen. For Zilan, it's a story that still has relevance today. I personally think this history got to be told it cannot be just forgotten and we just don't want these same things happen again if people don't talk about it they will not know this happened and especially for the children they who are still alive at the moment uh, they deserved the truth to be told like peter said i never have a father so how can i tell you how I feel about it. So I think the scar left in these people is huge and they deserve some kind of apology. Can you tell us any more about this story? If you can, please email us, sailors at cgtn.com. You've been listening to The Secret Betrayal with me, Jamie Owen. The producers were Elizabeth Mearns and Mark Ashenton. The sound editor, Terry Wilson and the series producer, Simon Morris. Mm -hmm.